This video is a supplement to the video What is wrong with labor theory of value, how value is really formed, and describes the formation of value in different market situations. The idea for this short video arose out of discussions on other videos on the same or similar subjects, including the video by reader Paul Cockshut against Hayek's subjectivism, and some videos by Victor Magarino. In the picture, the production and the associated consumption sphere of a society are shown schematically. On the right side of the picture, we see an entrepreneur, human workers and machines. The work products are shown in bar form, proportionally the associated costs and the expected surplus value when selling. So that there is surplus value when selling the products, the buyers have to completely reimburse the costs C and V and pay even more. The expected value is formed from the costs plus the expected surplus value, which is linked to the work product as a claim for reimbursement of costs and the surplus value and made visible as the offer price. Potential buyers who have enough money to buy the products are shown on the left. Three of the potential buyers dispense a value equivalent in the amount of the offer price in exchange for a work product each which thus changes from a potential to a real commodity. By exchanging the work product for a value equivalent, the social usefulness of the expenditure C and V is accepted in accordance with the amount of money and in many cases the demand for surplus value is also fully or partially accepted. This is how the value is formed. The value is shown as a green bar in relation to the expected value. In this example, all real values agree with the expected values, i.e. all expenses are recognized in full as socially useful and the required surplus value is seen as justified. The socially relevant costs recognized and reimbursed by a value equivalent as well as the real surplus value payment are shown on the right of the real values and contrast with the expected values, in this case they are all of the same size. This figure shows the situation that Marx describes with his value formula. Marx applies this formula to the production side of the commodity society. But only if all manufactured products are sold at the expected values, this formula also delivers the same result on the production side as on the market where the value is actually formed. This means that Marx's value formula can only be applied to the production side of the commodity society for this special case. At this point, the value formula of Marx should be discussed in more detail. On the right side of the picture, we see an entrepreneur, human workers and machines. To the left, the work product with its value shares C, V and S. On the left side, we see a potential buyer for the product. According to the classical interpretation of the labor theory of value, the surplus value is produced, but that cannot work in practice. 
the entrepreneur can neither work out the surplus value himself or have it worked out nor finance it himself. A buyer, in turn, cannot just pay only the surplus value to the entrepreneur. His money, which would be thought of as surplus value, would only cover a part of the production costs. In order for the entrepreneur to receive surplus value, the buyer must first fully reimburse the costs C and V and then pay even more. This only happens on the market, when the goods are exchanged for the value equivalent. The value formula can therefore only be applied to the market at the point of cooperation between buyer and entrepreneur where production costs are replaced and the real surplus value is paid for. With the exchange, the value is also formed as a social relationship and thus in turn the expenses and usually the demand for surplus value are recognized as socially relevant. The value size, as the value formula for the real value shows, does not correspond directly to the expenses plus the expected surplus value, but to the scope of the recognition of the expenses C plus V and the real surplus value payment. This example is based on the previous illustration. In contrast to this, three of the Berg products cannot be sold. The expected values of all products sold are completely achieved as real values. All expenses for these products are fully accepted, as is the expected surplus value. The expected values of the unsaleable products cannot even partially be converted into real values. They are completely marked with red as not achieved values. The expenditures made for this are not recognized as socially useful and therefore also not recognized as value creating. This makes it clear that human work alone cannot be the criterion for value creation. It is also important to recognize the work results as socially useful, as valuable for society. In this example, the first product is sold at the expected value. The second cannot achieve the full expected surplus value and consequently also not the full expected value. With the sale of the third product, only the expenses can be replaced, but no surplus value is achieved. Since no surplus value is paid, no so-called unpaid labor time can be realized. The entire labor time was necessary labor time. The entrepreneur cannot exploit with this product by selling it, since he does not earn more with the sale than it has cost him to manufacture and provide it. With the sale of the fourth product, not even the expenses can be reimbursed. In this case, there is also no so-called unpaid labor time but the necessary working time also only includes part of the total working time. A part of the work done remains in the status of private. As this part is not socially useful, the corresponding work results are given away. They become, proportionally, use values for others, but not through economic exchange. The fifth product does not generate any value. All expenses remain in the private stage 
as the work results remain in the private environment. The corresponding expenses are therefore not considered to be value creating. This picture shows Marx's statement about the average socially necessary work. All products are sold at their expected values, but the surplus values achieved are different due to different productivity. In addition, productivity differences are also shown separately for the areas V and C. The average surplus value achieved and the average value formation take place via the market and can neither be calculated nor explained from production. Only estimates are possible from there. The averaging takes place in both cases, average surplus value and average real value via the different real values on the market. Averages can only be calculated after the sales transactions have taken place. With the average surplus value, the average socially required labor hours and the socially average unpaid labor time achieved can only be determined via market sales by real values. Several work products are shown, five of which are sold with different results. The sale does not succeed with one of the ones shown. With the two products above, the expected values are realized on the market. With the third from the top, the expected surplus value and thus also the expected value are not fully achieved. With the fourth product, no surplus value can be achieved, and with the fifth, not even the expenses are reimbursed. Nonetheless, the top five products show an increase in value. This does not work with the sixth product. All the products sold flow into the total scope of all goods to be distributed economically. However, only the socially relevant values, i.e. the real values, should be effective for the total value of these goods and thus also for the circulation of money in the currency area under consideration. According to the classical interpretation of the labor theory of value, However, the labor of the labor forces directly determines the value, so that the expected values in terms of value would have to be included in the total scope of all goods to be distributed economically. However, that would be economic nonsense. The percentage of the total volume of all goods to be distributed economically reflects the value of the workforce and the other income earners. This is shown by the thick arrows in the lower part of the picture. In the values of the workforces, however, the expected values of products should not be included, but only the real values, as shown in the figure for the top five products. Only these real values of the workforces should be in turn be linked to the products as a claim to replacement. In the picture this is represented by the yellow arrows for the human workers and by the yellow-blue arrows for the machines and robots. The blue component in the letter is based on Marx's view that the machines are not part of the labor forces but belong to constant capital. Conclusion. Value as a social relationship is not a thing. 
but a relationship between people that can be assigned to things, activities, processes and ideas if there is an interest in their use and the objects of interest are not freely available. Above all, the work results, i.e. the products offered, which are included in the value relationships in connection with the expenditures made, are important for the formation of the values. The expenses are roughly reflected in the offer price. In the market, the unit of the expected usefulness of the work results and the expenses is assessed as part of the value formation. The classical interpretation of the labor theory of value describes a subjective and one-sidedly postulated value. It is seen in everything that is created by paid human labor regardless of the social significance of the work results. The theory of value presented here describes value as objective. It shows that objective societal recognition of what has been created as useful to society is necessary for value. This recognition of the useful takes place in a social relationship between the exchange partners on the market.